Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's really um, an honor to get to it's really an honor to get to uh, present this to you today. Um, this is kind of a heavy session so far. We've been talking about bile leaks and injuries and litigation. Um, I actually have a recurring nightmare that I'd like to share with you. Just um, get it off my chest. I have nothing to disclose, but I do have this recurring nightmare and it's kind of like, uh, you know when you were a kid and you had the nightmare that you would go to school and you were naked and you didn't know the, any of the a answers to the test and everything would sort of went upside down? My recurring nightmare is that I'm operating without gloves on. I, I don't know why I have this nightmare. This is another nightmare, right? You've already seen this slide once. This is another nightmare. You see this and you go, oh my gosh, I really hope that I don't screw this up. This is somebody who has a really bad infection. And um, when I look at these pictures, I think about, well, there are some things that we can do to prevent SSI. You can wear gloves, right? You can wear gloves in the operating room. I can fix that problem. But I can't fix the patient that comes in with that gallbladder. Um, these are the things that we know we can do to prevent surgical site infection. You have appropriately timed antibiotics of short duration. We avoid hypothermia, hypoxemia, hyperglycemia. We clip, we don't shave. We do a minimally invasive surgery when possible. We try not to spill stones and bile. Someone else is gonna talk about that. Um, we operate early in acute cholecystitis, or you can leave it for your partner so it's not your problem. So then you won't have the SSI, but they will. Um, use ERCP wisely, and like I said, wear gloves. I mean, it's a joke, but there are some things that we do in the operating room for every single case. We use good surgical technique, we do use sterile technique, and we follow all of those principles for a reason because many of them have been shown to reduce surgical site infection. So I'm gonna start off the evidence part of this talk with a really seminal paper that came out in 2003. Um, this was an epidemiological analysis at the time of transition from uh, open coli to laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And um, this was done by the CDC. Um, Lap coli was introduced in the late 1980s. And by this time that they looked at this data, it was the majority procedure, um, but nobody really knew if there was an advantage in terms of surgical site infection. So they did an epidemiological analysis from 92 to 99 um, using the N NNIS system, which is the former system that the CDC used to collect data on um, post-operative infections. And um, what they found was uh, there were you know, 50 54,000 inpatient cholecystectomies done. This is back when we even did lap coles as inpatients, right? Um, lap, lap increased from 59% in 1992 to 79% in 99. And obviously it's quite a bit more today and I'll show you that in the next study I have. Overall, the rate of SSI was very low. It was 1%. So like, why am I even doing this talk, right? It's so low, who cares? But look, the risk of SSI was lower in lap coli versus open. It was statistically significant. So you can see over time, the risk of surgical site infection from open decreased. And there was like a slight blip and in increase in the last year here in laparoscopic surgery. But you can see there's quite a, quite a gulf between open and laparoscopic surgery. Now, this does not account for how difficult the operation was, the tra you know, the transition, how many gallbladders somebody had done laparoscopically before they did it. This is a time of transition. So you may say, well, I don't really believe your data because this isn't how things go now. This is a wonderful study that was just published recently last year. Um, they looked at 66,000 procedures from a database that was, this is an uh, insurance database. And um, these are both inpatient and outpatient, both in hospital and freestanding ambulatory surgical center cases. Over 98% of the procedures were laparoscopic. So now we have gotten out of the era where we routinely do open cholecystectomy as an elective procedure. Of 1,034 open procedures, 535 of them were conversions from laparoscopy. So really, a very small percentage of these were open procedures from the very beginning. Again, a very, very low rate of surgical site infection, even lower than that was reported by the CDC study, um, which was 20, 
more than uh, 14 years uh, before. Um, so what else can we learn from this? The patient risk factors associated with SSI are listed here. Male, chronic anemia, diabetes, drug abuse, malnutrition, weight loss, obesity, smoking-related diseases, and staph aureus infection. Um, Post-operative risk factors that they had before uh, their SSI, chronic anemia and pneumonia, urinary tract infection. None of this should come as a, as a great surprise to us. Um, what is more interesting is looking at the, the data, looking at the, the type of facility, for example. You can see that the patients that are getting their operation done at an ambulatory surgery center are generally not going to get an SSI. These are, you know, your poor, beautiful Bluebird, Bluebird egg gallbladders that I never see at Harborview when I'm operating in the middle of the night. Um, so a laparoscopic approach with acute cholecystitis or obstruction was the reference uh, in this uh, multi, uh, uh, multivariable Cox proportional hazard model uh, analysis. Compared to that, laparoscopic approach with, uh, w sorry, without acute cholecystitis. If you had acute cholecystitis and you did it laparoscopically, you were at a higher risk than if you did not have cholecystitis. If you converted to an open approach, even if you didn't have acute cholecystitis, your risk of having an SSI was quite a bit higher. In fact, it was the highest of all of these different permutations, starting with open, um, without acute cholecystitis, starting with open, with acute cholecystitis, or laparoscopic converted to open with acute cholecystitis. So I'm not exactly sure why this is, but it may be that these patients actually had uh, something else going on or they were sicker. Um, it, it, it isn't accounted for in, in this analysis. But at any rate, I think we can reasonably conclude that if you're able to do a laparoscopic procedure and you don't have to convert to open and you're not dealing with acute cholecystitis, your risk of having an SSI is very, very low. It's less than 1%. Um, also interestingly, and I will get to another paper that addresses this later, um, with ERCP or bile duct exploration, you can see that the risk of developing an SSI uh, goes up considerably. Um, this is a brand new study that it hasn't even been officially printed yet. It's uh, uh, online only um, from uh, Dr. Belhamos and, and his colleagues. Uh, it's a single center with a prospective data collection. Um, they looked in their highly uh, acutely ill ac acute care surgery population, emergency general surgery population, um, that 50% uh, uh, underwent lap coli for acute cholecystitis in this in this series, and they had a 9.5% uh, conversion rate. Um, this was outcomes data was only available for 860 of the patients, uh, which was about I think 70% uh, of their cases. Um, actually, it's, sorry, about 86% because there were a thousand patients. Um, and they documented that there was bile spillage in 60% of the cases. And if you look at what kind of bile they spilled, 14% was an empyema, 10% was hydrops, and 76% was clear. So none of these really sound like usual bile. These sound like really infected gallbladders. Um, the overall SSI rate was 5.2, and the organ space infection, that means a deep surgical site infection, not in the skin, was 1.5%. Um, and I should mention that they found that bile spillage was associated with acute cholecystitis. When they looked at the cohort that had bile spillage compared to those that didn't have bile spillage, everything here is statistically significant except for a few things like other infectious complications or biloma or intra-abdominal abscess, just barely statistically significant. Everything else, um, an intraoperative complication, postoperative antibiotic administration, the hospital length of stay, any complication, incisional surgical site infection. So all these things were associated with uh, the bile spillage. So their conclusion was don't spill bile. But they also did say that, you know, these are very sick patients. These are the worst gallbladders you're going to see. And maybe there's something to that as well. This, remember, these are not elective, beautiful gallbladders like we've seen in those previous population-based studies. So it's important data. Uh, this is also an interesting study, although it has some problems. Um, uh, let's just say that 
their premise was that ERCP uh, we've heard of is associated not only with bacteremia, but we've heard of these terrible resistant, uh, antibiotic resistant infections that have been plaguing ERCP in the last couple of years because the scopes are getting contaminated and colonized. Um, they looked at 2,200 cholecystectomies performed in their single site, the University of Minnesota, between uh, 2010 and 2015. And um, they compared those ERCP patients that had their ERCPs within 60 days prior to cholecystectomy, and then 133 who had ERCP and cholecystectomy in the same setting. And it's a little bit difficult to tell in their methods whether or not that meant that they had an immediate postoperative ERCP or if it was right before the case. Um, it's unclear to me. However, what they did find was that these patients that had had ERCP within 60 days prior to their lap coli had a statistically significant higher rate of uh, uh, open uh, or converted to open as well as a higher rate of SSI um, uh, if they had their uh, coli after uh, their ERCP. You can see that it was a twofold increase. So uh, interesting and compelling data. I think we need to have more data to really answer this question, but it does beg the question as to whether or not we should be doing ERCP after lab coli rather than before. What about the timing of cholecystectomy? The trend is towards earlier and earlier cholecystectomy. Uh, this is a meta-analysis that was recently published in 2015. Uh, it looked at 16 studies reporting on 15 randomized control trials, so it's about 1,600 patients. You can see that as my talk goes on, we have fewer and fewer patients to talk about. Um, early cholecystectomy in this study was defined as within seven days onset of symptoms, so this is not within seven days of them coming to the hospital. This is by patient report. Um, they, they found that there were no differences in mortality, bile duct injury, conversion, or overall complications. Um, but they did find that the SSI rate was lower in patients that had their, their operation within seven days of onset of symptoms. I think this is very interesting and, and further argument for why we should be doing these operations early. Now, this does not address the issue of gallstone pancreatitis, and I'm not going to address that today. So, prophylaxis. We should give antibiotics prophylaxis, right? I mean, that's what the CDC tells us to do. We're, we're going to be good soldiers, and we're going to do that. This group did a network meta-analysis of 18 trials. They excluded five studies that used antibiotics post-op, which is good. They're just looking at perioperative antibiotics. And they wanted to see what the risk of surgical site infection was between those patients that didn't get perioperative antibiotics and those that did. And they actually found, looking at all of these different uh, prophylaxis regimens, that there was no difference in SSI between antibiotic prophylaxis patients and placebo or no intervention for elective cholecystectomy. This is not for acute cholecystitis, okay? These are only elective cholecystectomies being performed for some other reason. Um, so maybe we shouldn't be giving antibiotics to these people. Haha, -ha, wait a minute. This is a meta-meta-analysis. Anybody know what that is? So they looked at seven prior meta-analyses of low-risk cholecystectomy uh, that concluded that prophylaxis was unnecessary. There were seven of these already. So they did this, and they reviewed these 28 randomized control trials. They ruled that six of them were actually inappropriate for analysis, including one of acute cholecystitis. They found some miscounts in the number of outcomes, and in fact, their conclusion was that prophylactic antibiotics does reduce the risk of SSI and lab coli. <sighs> All right, so what are we going to do? Do we really need a randomized control trial of this? No. So I'm going to tell you for the last couple of minutes that I have about the guidelines that the Surgical Infection Society has put out about this. These are the things that give you an increased risk for SSI after lap coli. I'll make my slides available. You don't have to copy all of this. You can take a picture if you like. But these are pretty intuitive. You know, they include things like what I said before, uh, diabetes mellitus, acute cholecystitis, converting from lap to open, emergency procedures, bile spillage. Some of these things we can't know are going to happen before the operation. So what the Surgical Infection Society uh, created in this clinical practice guideline for the antimicrobial prophylaxis and surgery, this is for all different kinds of surgery, but specifically with regard to lap coli, they say because a number of these risk factors are not possible to determine before surgical intervention, it may be reasonable to give a single dose of antimicrobial prophylaxis to all patients undergoing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So do that. However, you do not need to give 
antibiotics after surgery. Did everybody hear that? Recent randomized controlled trials have found no more benefit for, for more than 24 hours of antibiotic therapy in patients undergoing cholecystectomy, even for acute cholecystitis. Even for acute cholecystitis. So antimicrobial use should be limited to no more than 24 hours. This is assuming that you have source control. So if you do the operation and you feel like you have not completely removed the gallbladder and there is still necrotic tissue that is infected that you have left behind, that is not a source control operation. That is unusual, right? Uncomplicated intra-abdominal infection in which the source control procedure can completely eradicate the infection is treated with 24 hours of antibiotics. So with source control, limit to 24 hours, and we recommend no more than four full days, 96 hours of antimicrobial therapy for patients with intra-abdominal infection who had an adequate source control procedure. So if you have somebody that presents to your emergency room and they're in septic shock and you take their gallbladder out, if you have source control and they are still sick after surgery, you can give up to 96 hours of antibiotics to treat their sepsis. This is an important trial, so if anybody wants any more information about this, this is a really important trial that was done um, with the consortium from the Surgical Infection Society looking at a trial of short course antimicrobial therapy versus uh, traditional, more uh, lengthy courses of antimicrobial therapy, and we found that um, giving four to five days of antibiotics was adequate. So if you do not have source control, no more than five to seven days of antimicrobial therapy should be provided to patients with an established intra-abdominal infection in whom a definitive source control procedure cannot be performed. We suggest instead that you follow the clinical parameters such as fever, leukocytosis, and adequacy of gastrointestinal function to determine if you can stop their antimicrobials sooner. Um, if they don't respond to antimicrobial therapy and get better within five to seven days, then you're going to need to do additional investigations to look for another source of the infection and to see if they have developed an intra-abdominal abscess that needs to be drained. That's all I have for you. I hope you're enjoying Seattle. It's a wonderful place to live. Just put on another layer. You'll be fine.